I think it's fair to say that uh, um, Gersh has been described as an uh, activist journalist. Um, and that's part of the reason we invited him here today was uh, not only his reporting on issues of pedestrian safety, um, but also his activism on that issue. Um, so uh, Gersh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're, we're happy to have you. Um, so, uh, you know, you recently were on a campaign uh, for, what was it, to create good mischief, create crim a good criminal mischief, something like, like that? John, like John Lewis used to say, yeah, good good trouble. Good trouble. Um, tell us about that. Why, why did you begin that? What was the point of that? Well, first of all, I guess you have to start with the question is like, how many of you guys have seen as you just walk around or, or bike around or even drive around, um, other cars that have plates that have been defaced or covered or, or leaves, you know, taped onto them. Because if you haven't seen it uh, and you start start to see it, you're never going to not see it. So um, I have always been aware of it because I've been working for Streets Blog. And one of the main uh, things we cover is the uh, increase in speed cameras as part of the Department of Transportation's efforts to, you know, rein in reckless drivers, um, as they started introducing more speed cameras, more and more drivers would cover their plates with an opaque cover or some sort of uh, defacing material. We write about it a lot, um, but the funny thing was nobody really pays that much attention to it because ultimately it's about one or two percent of the total number of plates that go past speed or red light cameras can't be read. And I think the city had decided that that was so low, so low a number that they didn't have to really worry about it. The problem was they in August, the speed cameras went to 24-7 operation. And as a result, the number of tick, the number of cars that could not be read by the speed cameras soared. Uh, we did a story a couple of weeks ago. They soared to, to more, <clears throat> excuse me, more than 7%. And so when you have 7% of the plates not being able to be read, um, the city starts to realize it's a real problem. So as a result of that uh, trend in people covering their plates, a friend of mine, a guy named Adam White, he's a lawyer whose clients almost are exclusively victims of road violence, you know, pedestrians or cyclists who've been hit by car drivers. Um, <coughs> he, he bikes to work every day and he noticed a guy who had a plate covered. A little bit of a piece of plastic was covering one of the letters in the, on the plate. So Adam got off his bike and moved the plastic now, unlike me, he didn't notice that there was the driver was still sitting in the front seat of the car. So that driver called the cops and the cops actually arrested Adam White and charged him with criminal mischief, which is kind of hysterical because criminal mischief is ostensibly a, a graffiti charge. Uh, it, it suggests uh, by it actually connotes that you cause damage to someone's property, which is funny because he didn't actually damage the property. He undamaged it. Um, so he got arrested. Now, fortunately, the, the Brooklyn District Attorney, Eric Gonzalez, dropped those charges because um, he probably could have made a case, but he realized that he, he would not have won that case. Uh, so he dropped those charges. But I did two things after Adam was arrested. I wrote a, a very hit, a very, a very catchy folk song called Criminal Mischief. And if you want to listen to it, it's on Spotify. I'm very proud of it. And it, it was meant to just be like a kind of a joke about like, how dare they arrest this guy and charge him with criminal mischief? But then after the song came out, I realized it'd be very funny to just go around the city undefacing plates. Uh, so I got an acrylic paint pen and I started, you know, repainting people's license plates. And here's where I think it's really of interest to the group here is that the vast majority of the plates that I would encounter were cars that were be that belonged to either cops, firefighters, or court or court officials, which is sort of astounding and then not astounding at all. Because if you've been in New York or long enough, you know that the cops uh, and the firefighters are are among the most egregious offenders of reckless driving and uh, illegal parking and all these things that we uh, we see them do around station houses, especially uh, you know if you know the Bay Ridge station house, the six eight, there's cars everywhere, the six two in um, Bensonhurst the same. Um, so I started de undefacing people's plates and um, caused quite a stir. Actually, uh, people really were. For the first time, even though we've been covering this story for a long time, people really started to take it seriously. I think partly the sight of a guy, and I'm not young, and I'm certainly not muscular or 
really very powerful in anything. But the sight of me, you know, doing this in people's mind, I think they they thought like, oh, this guy's going to get beaten up. And so people would watch to see if I would get beaten up. And, and of course, I haven't been beaten up, um, although obviously there's still a chance. Um, but people seem to like the videos. I've done about 120 of them now. They're all about 30 seconds. It's not a big deal. And it's hyster it's hysterical that most of the videos I've done uh, are cops and other law enforcement officials. So, um, you know, uh, my understanding was that, or, or the headline to the uh, Streets blog article was, you know, the era of criminal mischief is over. Um, I, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you uh, wrote a piece where, um, you know, you said, all right, it looks like something's actually being done about this. What, what, what's, what, what is, what's the result of this campaign? Well, I mean, that was a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, I, the headline did have a question mark. Is this the end of criminal mischief? Um, I, a lot of people in my cohort of friends who, and you can use the word friends in quotes, um, has been concerned that I'm going to get beaten up. And they've encouraged me to pull back from this because I've gotten a lot of attention for this. The New York Times wrote it up. The New Yorker wrote it up. Uh, you know, a bunch of people have, have done this. Um, so I've gotten the, the, the people, the public is aware of the problem now. And as a result of that, the governor recently announced in her budget that she was going to triple the fine for covering a plate. And also, in addition to the fine, law enforcement officials would actually be empowered to remove the cover. So that was a, actually kind of a big step forward because um, the cops do write some tickets for covered plates, not that many. But suddenly, if it's a $300 ticket, it would send a message to people who cover their plates that this is not you know, the tickets for getting a speeding ticket is only $50. So suddenly you'd be getting a ticket for six times that if you cover your plate. So that was a big step forward. And then the mayor had talked about, uh, the mayor has talked about the NYPD stepping it up a little bit and also, um, you know, uh, not just cracking down, but also um, uh, changing some laws and, and the city council is talking about it. So I'd felt that I didn't need to necessarily put my... Um, you know, well-being at risk, although I sort of enjoy it because, you know, most of the people, as I said, are cops. So I think if a cop were to, you know, beat me up on camera, that would be um, something we would be talking about in a much larger group, I think. So uh, I may still do it. I did one today that I thought was hilarious because somebody had a, a little police insignia covering the last two digits of his or her plate. And all I did was just flick it down and, it, and suddenly it wasn't covering the plate. So like, I don't, think of I'm putting myself at great risk doing that and it's I think it's hilarious so I'll keep doing it when it's safe and and, and prudent so let's pull back a, a little bit um so you and others at streets blog um you know cover issues like you know defacing license plates to get around tickets um you know uh, backlash to speed cameras um you know backlash to you know one of the formational issues of this group uh, actually was when you may remember there was a proposal to increase the speed limit of Ocean Parkway by 10 miles per hour. Yeah. Um, and the people here were, you know, not happy about that, um, especially those who lived in or on Ocean Parkway. Um, so, um, you know, where do you feel New York was? Where do you feel it's going? You know, is, is New York becoming a safer place for bicyclists and pedestrians? Say in uh, the last... No. No, it's funny. People often ask me that they want me to be optimistic because the city has built, you know, scores of miles of protected bike lanes. So people say, well, isn't that an indication? And the city has built, you know, hundreds of acres of pedestrian plazas and the city has widened some sidewalks. And it's done a lot of things that, you know, we have called upon them to do and we're very supportive and it's great. Ninth Avenue, for example, in Manhattan just got double wide sidewalks and it's beautiful to look at it. It really is. Um, but the overall is that the number of fatalities um, has been fairly stagnant. Uh, we've never gotten under 200 road fatalities in the city of New York in the Vision Zero era or before. Um, uh, and that may not sound like much, but then when you add in the number of people who are injured every year in crashes, it's more than 110 people per day are injured in crashes uh, caused by car drivers. 200 car crashes a day are reported to the NYPD. And those, those are just the reported crashes. So those are big statistics. What When you talk about is a reason for optimism, the reason I always say no is simply because there are gaps in what the city is doing. We build protected bike lanes, but we don't have a cohesive network 
you you guys are in Southern Brooklyn. Um, Justin Brannon is a, a someone I talk to fairly regularly. I I like him as a person, but he is not supportive of protected bike lanes. I mean, we have to be honest about that. Um, his challenger, Ari Kagan, is even worse. Um, you've got um, you mentioned the speed limits on Ocean Parkway. I mean, Chaim Deutsch and um, Kalman Yeager are are two people. Well, Deutsch isn't in the office anymore, but those people are deleterious to safety in New York. And when I talk to the Department of Transportation, they say, sure, we would love to do more in Southern Brooklyn. We'd love to do more in Borough Park and Bay Ridge and Bensonhurst, but we don't have support on the ground. And, and they're not talking about you, obviously. They're talking about the council people in those areas. I mean, Justin Brannon, like I said, he's a Democrat. And I have a lot of things I talk to him about where we are, I'm a liberal Democrat. We, we, we have a lot of common ground. But we don't on bike lanes. Uh, he'll say a lot of the positive things. And he talks about how city bikes should be expanded to Bay Ridge, which it should, obviously. Um, but you're, you know, unless you're willing to put some political capital behind um, protected bike lanes, which, again, is not a challenging thing. Protected bike lanes help local businesses. We've, we've proven this in many articles on Streets Blog and the Department of City Finance, the Department of Finance has proved it as well. So they're good for business. They're good for safety and they're better for neighborhoods. Now, yes, some people would be slightly inconvenienced in the ability to find a parking space easily, but we want to move New York away from the fossil fuel engine anyway. So it's a win, 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 win if you bring, build protected by this. But, you know, Justin Brannon and Calvin Yeager and, and Ari Kagan and I can keep going on are not supportive of these measures. So that's why I have limited reason for optimism when I can't even get common ground with a democratic official in a, you know, a, a neighborhood like Bay Ridge, which would benefit so, so profoundly from protected bike lanes. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and certainly uh, a lot of us here have um, similar experiences where even when we're getting along with our elected officials, um, they're not necessarily helping um, with these sorts of issues. Um, yeah, I'd like to open the floor up at this point. I mean, you know, I, I, I love talking to this issue, uh, and I'm very happy that, uh, Mr. Kunzman could join us, but I'm, it looks like other people could too. Uh, so, um, Baruch, you're the first one I saw with your hand up. So oh, thank you very much for that great presentation. And I've been an avid reader of the street blog on and off for putting blurbs on our Facebook page, as people can witness. <clears throat> several things come to my mind. The mayor, the pretend mayor, I really call him pretend because he never really was a good fit for the job, sets the tone. And he also caters uh, or he curries favor with the masses by serving whatever works locally. So whereas we have major congestion here in Midwood and in Borough Park, there are areas outside where they have, do have real bike lanes and real flow of traffic. Now, uh, there are other issues. There are the blocking the intersection, there is double parking, so that at major crowding traffic intervals during the day, priority vehicles can get through. Now that's all due to a lack of enforcement. Where are all of the meter maze as so-called traffic enforcement agents? Where are they disposed? Why don't they just distribute them on a very random basis to come down and do a mass sweep any time of the day when we have these major congested points? Do you get my drip? Yeah. We get the city council to promote quality of life issues, not for the dwellers who are self-serving because driving is a privilege, it's not a right. And this will, uh, getting away from the argument of moving away from climate change, just the fact that it is deleterious for the quality of life of the safety because Avenue J and Avenue M in Midwood and Kings Highway, Kings Highway does have a, a very minor bike, um, sorry, bus route, right. a bus, the dedicated bus paths. But we need one on 39th Street in Borough Park from 13th Avenue all the way down to 9th Avenue because of all the shops that are on there. And they 
block double parking with their vehicles going for shoppers. Okay, the same here in Midwood. So I'm just repeating myself. But the point is, there should be more enforcement of existing traffic laws and additional restrictions during high traffic intervals during the daytime. And we need to get a major push to the city council to get the at least progressive wing, those who signed on to the document, to start the momentum for this enforcement. And also to call out the mayor and, and, and start ridiculing him. I try to ridicule him at every point that I can do, but if, I'm, I don't know how much pushback it serves. Okay, thank you for my rant. I, I like the rent. I will say one thing. The ridicule in the mayor doesn't work with this particular mayor, but I will tell you a couple of things that you said that were very relevant to the stuff I cover every day, and that is enforcement. Um, the NYPD um, has really dramatically reduced its enforcement. Obviously, there are uh, traffic enforcement agents who give tickets for meet, uh, meter infractions and parking at a hydrant, but uh, those people are not really aggressively writing tickets for double parking. Uh, and the police are doing a much, much less of, a, of that. And I've looked at their moving violations and their non-moving violations, and the number of tickets they're writing is far less than they did during the early days of the de Blasio era. Right after, right after de Blasio announced Vision Zero, there was a, a big increase in speeding tickets, red light tickets, failure to yield tickets, and, and moving other moving violations. And that's come back and actually gone far lower than it was even at the start of the de Blasio administration. Now, part of the reason for that is obviously the... There are 200, sorry, 2,000 speed camera systems in New York City right now that are operating 24-7, and those are writing millions of tickets. So that's a positive thing. The only difference between a ticket writ written by an officer and a ticket written by a camera is the ticket written by a cop goes on your license. You get three points for that. And if you get three of those tickets, you lose your license. If you get 30 speed camera tickets, as long as you keep paying them, you don't, you don't, pay, you don't face any, any punishment at all. So that's a real problem. And if you want to talk to the political establishment about that, the DOT often talks about how it could crack down on multiple speed camera violations if it had more money for this thing they call the dangerous vehicle abatement program, uh, which right now doesn't have a lot of teeth in it, but could, you know, it could. It, it requires you to take a safety class if you get 15 or more speeding tickets. Now, just imagine that 15 or more speeding tickets in a year. To me, a safety class is a little too late. Uh, if you're getting 15 speedy tickets, I, like I've been, I, I was a driver for many years. I drove for probably 20 years, my first 20 years in New York. I got one speeding ticket ever. Now this is before the days of cameras, but if you get 15 speeding tickets in a year, you're not just a danger to, to yourself, you're a danger to yourself and others. And in the old days, we used to commit people uh, if they were a danger to themselves and others. Uh, in, nowadays, we just let them pay 50 bucks. If I may interject, why not elevate it to the state level so that there be enforcement at the state level to remove the license and to penalize, to actually go have the state people come down and repossess the car or impound it and, yeah. and also get our legislators to up the uh, penalties yeah. for those who evade it. Okay, just like oh. the MTA is cracking down right now on these random passes, you know, yeah. at different intervals. Correct. So, you know, State Senator Gernardis, who I'm sure you're familiar with, has a lot of bills in this area, and he wanted to increase the penalties. He wanted the speed camera tickets to count against a driver's license. A lot of that had to be uh, comp was compromised out because he really wanted to pass the 24-7 speed camera bill last year, which actually was quite a legislative achievement of his. Um, but many other provisions of that bill, some of the ones you're talking about, are still pending and they could they will be they ha they have been reintroduced. It's a question of whether he can get support for them. You remember, a vast number, a vast portion of the number of people who are getting repeat speed tickets are members of the political establishment themselves. I mean, Councilwoman Ina Vernikov in your area, for example, has more than a dozen speeding tickets. Uh, Joanna uh, Joanna Ariola has more than a dozen speeding tickets. Uh, Joe Borelli, the head of the GOP caucus, um, has speeding tickets. So these are not people who are eager to uh, visit this issue. Um, you know, my my advice to you would be to elect different people. Thank you. Yes, so we we try that sometimes. Uh, Jeffrey, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, I have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, Gersh, I know you a long time since, and you probably know my wife Ida. 
uh, Sanoff. Okay. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the enforcement, the traffic enforcement people, uh, I belong to the 60th Precinct Council, and it's basically we don't have enough because they don't. They're on a voluntary basis. Whether the the, the people, the agents there, if they want to work on the weekend, they can work, but they're not forced to work. So really? They, yes. Yes. Okay. They they they're, they're uh, in, especially in Coney Island and Brighton Beach. There's always double parking along Brighton Beach Avenue or along Surf Avenue, uh, Mermaid Avenue. But yeah. if you don't, they can't have. They don't have enough uh, resources to put the people out there because they don't want to work on the weekends. It's up to them. Okay. Secondly, you can check that out. Yeah, yeah, I will check that. It's, I've never heard that before. And I've, yeah. I've been in New York for 35 years. Check that out with one PP. Uh, secondly, are you familiar with the... I'm all for uh, protective bike lanes, all for that public safety. But have you checked out the one on Emmons Avenue? Yeah. It's a gauntlet to go through there. It's yeah. a gauntlet. The, I think the, it was really, really designed poorly. So, look, not every protected bike lane is perfect. I, I know that. I sometimes don't feel fully safe in them. Uh, but Emmons Avenue was a real problem because, as you know, you were trying to connect a couple of greenways and make make it safe to get through Sheepshead Bay. Because I come down Ocean Parkway a lot and then head out to the Rockaways on on, on that gr nice greenway along the, the bay. And the, the part in Emmons was, was a terrible stretch, very dangerous stretch. So they needed to do something. They didn't have local support from Chaim Deutsch on that. In fact, he opposed they it. They have, didn't do it until he left. And they didn't have support from the chair, uh, Teresa Scavo, on that. Yeah, that's the right. Community, you know, it was just poorly designed. I mean, I see the, the cars park on one side, and then on the right side is the, uh, the bike lane. Mm. And I could see a lot of accidents just happening, people parking their cars with the bikes. Well, I still I think it is safer. I mean, if you look at the numbers, since the bike lane has been installed, uh, I'll check this. I'm not, I don't know what this bike lane, but I bet you would find that the crash numbers are down, uh, you know, and injuries are down. That would be a good point. I, I will look into that. I'll look into that. Because okay, it's thanks. been open for about uh, almost about a year six now? Six months. Six months? About six months. Okay, I can look at those numbers. I could report back to you on that. Very good. Yeah, um, the, I mean, the numbers are um, it, like the, the good of, you know, of bike lanes and dedicated bus lanes, um, you know, sort of often can't be understated. I mean, it's my understanding that not only do they help bikes and buses get where they want to go, you know, more quickly, they can also help with the flow of traffic in general. I, I've actually at Streets Blog, you know, we, we it really not writing about bikes all the time. It's really mostly about transit. And the, the I always say to my staff, the, the best bike lane is a bus lane. And I don't mean it in the sense that bikes are going to ride in the bus lane, but if you have a dedicated bus lane and it works and, and people in the neighborhood know that they can get from point A to point B reliably on a bus, they'll drive a lot less. And really the biggest, uh, the biggest cause of car crashes uh, on city streets is cars. So if you were to take a hundred people out of their car and put them on a bus with a dedicated bus lane, you know, that's a lot fewer crashes that are likely to happen. So I, we, Dedicated bus lanes are like, it's one of those things where, you know, I talked to Selvina Brooks Powers, for example, the transportation committee chairwoman, and um, she understands what I say when I say, you know, we really need to have more dedicated bus lanes. But at the end of the day, they built them in Jamaica and she opposed them. And Councilwoman Natasha Williams says she lives in a transit desert, but then she opposed the bus lane, the dedicated bus lane on Jamaica Avenue. So you explain that to me, like people complain all the time about living in a transit desert. Actually, there's almost no place in New York City that's an actual transit desert because the buses go everywhere, almost everywhere. They just feel like a transit desert because the buses aren't running very efficiently because there's so many, pardon my French, damn cars in the way. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, Zonera had her hand up next. So go ahead. Yes, but mine is a little off topic and I see Jeff's hand up. So if he wants to ask first, he, he is my first vice chair, so. I see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, second vice chair. <laughs> uh, Gersh, I know you, you're doing public safety with bicycles and things like that. 
But a, a big problem, even with the uh, the dedicated bike lanes, we have a lot of electric bike delivery people and scooters. They don't they don't even see the bike lanes. Right. Uh, it, it's something that is causing a lot of uh, deaths. I think unnecessary with the uh with this just disregard of any type they go right right in front of me at a red light and they go right through the red light on ocean parkway right let let me let, i want to address two things about that so first of all there's very few deaths related to delivery workers uh causing crashes they they do get in crashes obviously because they do ride on these uh, electrified mopeds now a couple of things about this it's very important to understand um, I live in Windsor Terrace. Uh, I, I, I'm on the Upper West Side a lot because we, we cover a lot of things up there. Community Board 7, for example, is uh, raising the, the alarm about the Wild West conditions on our street. And I 100% agree that the roadways become dangerous when vehicles are traveling at different and high speeds. No question about that. However, we do have to remember that this entire industry of deliveries is built on a false premise. And that false premise is I can be sitting at my home in Windsor Terrace and I can order a burger from Brooklyn Heights and have it in my house in 10 minutes. And mind you, the, the restaurant is somehow going to pay for that because the tech giant has figured out an algorithm to get underpaid and exploited workers to speed around on devices that they have to pay for without workers' compensation or compensation if they're injured. And they get punished if the burger's not there in 10 minutes. This is a crazy system. Now, you're 100% right. That it require that system has them going too fast and has them sometimes doing things that they shouldn't do. But the problem is, as Upton Sinclair said in the jungle, you can't allow you can't expect the lowest paid person in an unfair exploitive system to be the one who fixes that system. We need to come up with a system. And one of those things the mayor talked about the other day, which was potentially wider bike lanes with multiple lanes, slower bike traffic, medium speed bike traffic, moped traffic. And then the other thing obviously is these mopeds right now, they're op most of them are operating illegally. A moped needs to have a license plate and it needs to have a driver with a driver's a, a, a motorcyclist with a, with a proper license. Now I'm not saying I wanna bring the NYPD down to bear on the lowest paid, most exploited workers in our society, but the bare minimum is have your license have a moped with a license plate, because then in the event of a tragic crash, there would be accountability. And there is accountability. I mean, moped drivers do get you know, caught and they do get punished. But I do want to reiterate, they are the tiny minority of crashes in the city of New York. I remember at one time Domino's Pizza advertised, uh, we'll deliver your pie in less than, I think it was 30 minutes and everybody, but they don't do that anymore. Because there was a problem with that, Kirsch. Well, in New York, it would be very almost impossible to do that unless you were unless you were on one of those electric bikes or a moped. Outside of the outside of New York, it's very easy to do that. They get they have delivery guys in cars. Hmm. We don't want that either because now you'd have sixty five thousand cars because there's, there's sixty five thousand deliveristas in New York. Now they're not all working all the time, but in some parts of the city, you know, frankly, there's a lot of deliveries because people have become accustomed, unfortunately because the tech giants have made it easy, they become accustomed to ordering things that uh, normally the, they would order locally. You would order maybe a pizza from the, your local guy. No, now they're getting pizza from three neighborhoods away. Well, I'm all for fair wages and a living wage for the delivery people, okay? They do an extremely important job for everybody, I guess, on this call, okay? I order at least twice a week from uh, Chinese or, or Italian, and uh, thank God they they come and, and deliver it properly. But it's still an issue with the with them not uh, uh, following the rules of the road. Well, but you've asked them to do a very difficult job. Uh, you know, it, it, you've asked them to get things to you, Jeffrey, that are that it's hard to do <laughs> quickly at that pay. Anyway. Yeah. All right, Sanara, go ahead. Yes. Hi, Gersh. Thank you for joining and giving such a really informative discussion. And I'm sorry if this was brought up earlier. I dropped a few times. Um, but I think there's something in front of city council right now. Intro, I think 
501 or something mm. like that. Um, if you could describe what that is, from my understanding, it's gotten watered down tremendously, but I don't know what the original version versus what it is now and what are the chances of it passing and what it means to us as New Yorkers. Well, so Intro 501, uh, and thank you, it sounds like you read Streets Block. Um, intro 501 was a bill introduced, actually introduced by Steve Levin of Williamsburg in the prior council, but uh, Lincoln Wrestler has picked it up. And basically he calls for a couple of things. One is the public would be able to report people parked in bike lanes, bus lanes, at hydrants, double parked, uh, and have the, the ticket be issued directly. Obviously, there'd be normal jurisprudence. You'd be able to you know, you'd be able to fight the ticket, but it wouldn't have to be like a 311 call where you report something, it goes to the cops, and if they even show up, obviously the double parked car is gone by the time they show up. So this would be a direct, you'd take a picture and you'd send it off and, and then there would be a ticket issued. That's a great thing. Now, in addition to that, the person who filed the complaint would get 25% of the resulting ticket. Now, the reason that that's uh, interesting is because they do that with the currently with the idling Commercial idling, if you re report an idling, and these, these tickets get up to $300, $600 for multiple offenses, you know, people, people have an incentive to report them. Uh, and, it, and that program is more or less working. The problem with Wrestler's Bill is it uh, went into the meat grinder of, city hall, of the city council, and the 25% bounty was immediately cut out. And in addition to that, um, they added in a stipulation that the car would have to be unoccupied at the time that the offense was witnessed. Now, that's a, a bid by the council to try to avoid co uh, conflict. You know, if, you're, if someone's in a car and they see you take a picture of the car, they freak out. But if they're not in the car, if they have to be not in the car, it's kind of a hypocritical because a car with someone in it or with someone not in it is still a danger to bicyclists. It's still obstructing bus traffic. It's still blocking a fire hydrant. So whether the person is in there or not in there, it should be getting a ticket for that offense. Um, so that's been taken out. Now, nonetheless, a lot of the activists in the community I cover, uh, the livable streets community, the safe streets community, they still support the bill because it would still allow the public to directly report these things uh, and have a ticket be issued, which, you know, like I said, the NYPD has abrogated its responsibility to write these tickets. So that's a positive step forward. The question is whether members of the public will take time out of their own day uh, and potentially lose their own wages to write these tickets is a, is a, is a question mark now. Interesting. 100% we would. I didn't hear that. What? I said 100% we would. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I, you know, there, there's, an, there's an app um, called Reported, which allows you to write these kind of tickets against um, taxi drivers. And in fairness to the TLC, they take these things very seriously. And there are, they do, in fact, Unlike 311, they do follow up and, and these drivers are ticketed. I used to write a lot of reported uh, complaints when taxi drivers bike, block bike lanes, but I have gotten weary of it because it's just such a, a big effort to stop, take a picture, pull over, do the whole thing. And, and, and so I don't do it as much. I think a 25% bounty was very reasonable and, and wise, but uh, that, got, that got cut. Um, all right, I've let other people speak, so I'm going to come back around again. Um, so sort of out of nowhere, uh, the governor put in her uh, budget proposal uh, residential parking permits in, for New York City. What's, what's your opinion on these? What's going on here? So it's funny. Residential parking permits are one of those weird things where members of the safe streets community are sometimes divided. Um, but one thing that they are unified on is the price would have to be proper. In other words, there's a couple of problems with it. We in the who, who advocate for safe streets don't like the idea that the curbside lane is seen as a parking lane because the curbside lane, as we've seen during COVID, can be many things. It could be a space for restaurants to thrive and succeed in, in a difficult climate. It's a place for bike lanes. It's a place for dedicated bus lanes. So the minute you create residential parking permits, you're now selling that space at a fairly low price because the city, the state legislature talked about a maximum of $30 a month which is a bargain basement price considering the value of the curbside lane in most parts of the city. Um, so now you've underpriced it, but you've still given drivers the feeling of ownership of it. They already feel like they own it and now they'd actually be paying for it. You're never gonna get them to give up that space for a bus lane, a bike lane, 
uh, a restaurant space, a parklet, a plaza, a wider sidewalk. So that's the main problem with it. One of the upsides that we've seen people talk about is if you price it properly, and people talk about $5,000 a year, for example, um, it might actually depress car ownership because people would be like, well, I'm not going to pay $5,000 to park my car when it used to be free. I'm going to get rid of this car. The downside, the, the flip side of that is if you price it too low, people who never would have thought to get a car, think about people on the Upper West Side whose experience with parking is, is you know, Seinfeld episodes where it's impossible to park. Well, if suddenly only people who live in the neighborhood could park um, in a neighborhood where only 10% of the households own cars, suddenly people are like, oh, I'm going to get a car because now I've got a permit that only cost me $300 a year and I'm going to get a spot. So there's a lot of, there's a lot to be discussed. And like you said, it sort of came out of nowhere in the governor's budget. Um, when, when she was borough president, uh, Gail Brewer in Manhattan had done a fairly exhaustive study of these um, permit systems in other cities, London, Copenhagen, some neighborhoods and various cities have them. And it, her report was, was inconclusive that this would be a positive, a net positive for New York. And it was sort of funny because reports that are inconclusive often just kind of get buried but the inconclusiveness of the report was telling. It, it's not a it's not a silver bullet for any of the problems we're talking about. Yeah, I've also heard uh, electeds who are in support of it say, "Oh, it's a way to help you know prevent all the the insurance fraud that's going on. That you know people register their cars in New Jersey or Florida. You know, you, certainly around my neighborhood, yeah. it seems like half the people here are their grandmother from Florida is visiting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and to, for you know, in order to be able to park, you would actually need to have residence and residential registration. It's true. But, but you know, there's so many scams going on. Like <laughs> if you can get a fake, you can get fake temporary places, all, all manner of ways in which drivers elude even the existing laws. I'm, I'm not convinced that that would be the silver bullet on that. I, I, I do agree that it would be one way to cr clamp down on out-of-state plates. Um, I've been doing a series called uh, Where Do My Neighbors Live, which you know also has a, a hit song that you can listen to on Spotify. Um, but uh, uh, it, 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 I look at people's plates and then I run the plate against the city database of tickets. And if you have a Florida plate and you have no tickets, well, maybe you are visiting from Florida. But if you have a Florida plate and you have tickets in New York City, you know, dozens every year dating back to 2013. My guess is you don't live in Florida. You know, Gersh, how are you? Thank you for coming. I'm sorry I'm late for the meeting. Is that We've Blake had... Morris? Yes, it is. Yes. When are we going to get you elected, Blake? I don't know. <laughs> we we'll probably have to get this residential parking permit situation worked out. So Gersh and I, always we've had this conversation over time in the past. So, I mean, one of the issues is, I mean, I certainly would, I certainly support residential parking permits. Almost every major city has them except for us. So we're, we're we are the outliers. So you'd have to explain why we're doing something that, that nobody else is doing. That's one. And two, that basically it, it's not the residence of the person. It's the residence of the automobile. So you want that car registered in New York City. And probably mm -hmm. most of the registrations are actually not even, it's not a question of being out of state. Those are the most visible. I think most of the, of the car registrations are actually in the suburban ring and people, mm -hmm. are, people are actually registering their car, you know, with their sister in suburbia. Right. You know, well, their you brother know, in New Jersey. Well, and you know, so, Blake, you and I have disagreed on residential parking permits. Yes. Uh, I'm still a supporter. But I don't know. I mean, I don't, look, I, I, if your question is, would it work in some neighborhoods? Again, I think it would have to be priced a certain way. And I do think in some neighborhoods, it might encourage people to get cars. And that's what I'm afraid of. Well, I wouldn't have it. I wouldn't have it restricted by neighborhood because the city's been balkanized enough. So I certainly if the issue was it came with a neighborhood protection provision, I would definitely be opposed to it. We have enough issues, enough people who want to carve up the city into little fiefdoms. So, uh, sorry, so what, 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 would the, what would the neighborhood protection provision be? I'm not sure I understand. Well, a lot of people who support residential parking permits also have this poison pill concept that they also want it that only only um, cars registered in that neighborhood could park ah. there. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason they want to put that in there is because like in um, Astoria, Queens, for example, people drive over from other neighborhoods, they park and then they take the subway in. Um, 
so I understand that. Uh, it, it is, you're right about the balkanization. I mean, we are one, one city, but if you're going to do residential parking permits and they're zoned by neighborhoods, presumably you already have part of that built into the system. I, I, in fairness to the, the governor, I, I don't think there's, a, there's not a plan that we're looking at. And that's the thing that I think is, is challenging for all of us. You know, I know, Blake, you support residential permits. I'm not saying I would never support them, but I, I'd like to see a plan. Uh, what I've seen so far has not worked. People in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, tell me it doesn't work. People in Boston tell me it doesn't work. And look, I, I don't have friends in London, but the report that, um, uh, that, that Gail Brewer put out said that the neighborhoods in London d experienced a threefold increase in car ownership. And I think that that's going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I don't know what their insurance rates are. So yeah, again, it, I don't know. Yeah, right. So New York, so New York, you know, you'd have to look at some other cities where the insurance rates in New York City are actually three, a multiples of three yeah. compared to the suburban rent. So it's not yeah, just if, so if, if you, you made that registration over, you, you know, we're, you know, someone who's paying a thousand dollars a year for insurance is not going to pay thirty five hundred dollars a year for insurance. Well, I mean, you say that you know, New York's insurance is more expensive. But it's not a factor of three. It's more like a factor of two, from what I've understood, at least according to some, something I saw the other day. And, you know, $2,000 over the course of a year, uh, if you're a car owner, uh, is that the reason you would or wouldn't buy a car? I don't think that's the reason. Um, I think the difficulty in finding a parking space, I think congestion pricing, all these factors that we're trying to push to get people to realize that owning a car is a sucker's deal. I mean, it is a sucker's deal. It costs you thousands of dollars just to have the car. Parking it is a hassle, and you've got the world's best. Well, I shouldn't say world's best because I'm not a I'm not a New York you know snob. But you've got one of the the, the nation's best transit system, you, literally outside your door, or in some cases a, a short bus right away. We need to make car driving, you know, really onerous and and a difficulty. Because what I found in other cities, we've done, I've done the research on this and, and read the research. Sorry, building bike lanes is great. Building bus lanes is great. But people do not give up their car unless you make it incredibly expensive. And, and that's not punitive, by the way. I want to be very clear on this because I, friends of mine have cars. It's not punitive to make it expensive to drive a car. You merely are trying to re-internalize all the externalities that car drivers have put on us. The pollution, the congestion, the road violence, the unlivability of our streets. They're pushing that on to us, the non-car owners. And, I, and that's, that's what our society has allowed them to do. What we need to do is push it back onto them. You want to drive a car, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay through the nose for it because we've already established a great transit system for you. And we want our kids to be able to walk and visit their friends before they're age 16. Like I couldn't let my kid go visit his friend down, down the street until he was like 16 years old. That's crazy. That's insanity because they've externalized all the damage of cars. All right. Um, we're clearly enjoying this, Gersh. I don't know uh, what your time commitments are. Well, um, I mean, I have a life, obviously, outside of the uh, criminal mischief business. Um, I, <laughs> I would urge you, I, I can give you a couple more minutes, obviously, because you guys are obviously sharp. And I really love this group because I've spoken to a lot of political organizations, especially community boards. And like, wow, there's such a lack of knowledge uh, among most community boards. So this is very refreshing, I have to say. Um, but I, I would also say, like, if you're interested in these topics, um, I, I do urge you to read Street's blog and certainly comment on the on the stories because we do, you know, cover a lot of the fundamental issues of these. It's not all propaganda. And there's a lot of like we are interested in talking about residential parking permits. We we really want to understand it um, and stuff like that. We we read a lot of stories like that. Cool. But yeah, I'll right, give let's you give I, I, a little more time. Jeff, Jeff, uh, and, just very, and Zanera very quickly, quickly got her hand up. Let's do quickly. those two, and then we'll uh, just very quickly we'll let her go. I was in Manhattan Beach yesterday. I was going to the dentist whose who office is over there. And the sign is they have their own private parking in the summertime. There's no parking allowed May to, to September. Wait, where? They, they, they in, in fact, have their own in Manhattan private, Beach. Uh, Beach. private yeah. privacy parking. Now, yeah. to me, I, I think I know why, but I'm not going to get into the racial is, issues of it. But uh, how would somebody, re you know, turn that around? Mm. It shouldn't be. It should be, you know, equal for everybody. I don't even well, make my appointments at the dentist in the summer because of that, because <laughs> I can't park there. Um, well, I'm sure, I can't I'm take sure a bicycle. I'm a little I'm sure. old for that now. 
I'm sure when you get to the dentist in September, it's a bit of a rude awakening. But um, I don't know the answer. I think that like when I go to the Rockaway and is Rockaways in the summer, obviously I bike, but um, there's no parking at all along the, those streets because they don't want to encourage people to drive to the beach. Uh, so I think in some ways that's a positive thing. The negative, the downside of that is they're excluding a, a broad number of New Yorkers from going to the beach, which is their their tangential goal, I think, uh, at least in the Rockaways. Um, but it's true that having tens of thousands of people driving to the beach is not is not positive for your community either. So I do think there's a balance. Manhattan Beach, um, you know, th there's been issues there, as you mentioned, with, with uh, you know, racial bias. So there's, obviously that's part of it. You know, if we started doing this in Brighton Beach and in, in Coney Island saying you're not going to park it during the summer, we have 5 million visitors every year. Well, you know, remember Coney in. Island is Coney Island is at the end of four four great subway lines, and, and 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 you know, my father, who grew up in Williamsburg, still delight, and he's ninety years old. He delights in telling me stories of how they took the subway to Coney Island and spent all summer there, and you know, they didn't have a car, <laughs> and everything seemed fine. God bless them. Yeah. God bless them. They also had the Dodgers. Right. So we 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 don't they have did. The all right. All right, Zanera, why don't you finish us off on our... Um, okay. I, you know, you mentioned the community board, Gersh, and how it has a bit of a different reaction when you speak versus this group. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, I'm a part of a community that is a lot of, it's immigrant heavy, it's older adults. Um, that's kind of Southern Brooklyn in general. How can we have these conversations where, you know, we're moving the needle a bit more towards safety, more towards community-driven conversations. Um, I do think at times there tends to be a quick reaction um, where people are like, well, this is the route I've always taken. This is the route that I'm used to, you know? And I'm, I want to find a middle ground where we can be conscious of all of our residents and the many modes of transportation. Well, it's funny you describe it as a middle ground. So one of the problems is the notion of a middle ground. And, and I don't say that as a negative thing because I do think you have to meet people where they live and, 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 and good politics brings people to the table. No question about that. But the Overton window needs to shift and, and in this way and this way only. Everybody needs to get around. We all accept that. But we, we can't use as the baseline for the discussion, well, this is the way I've always gotten around. Because the problem is that's actually not even true because in the 1920s, 19 teens, people got around in very different methods. And then suddenly the automobile age started and then there was a new normal uh, in, P in some people's mind, a new normal. And unfortunately, this new normal has actually shifted the Overton window the wrong way towards modes of transportation that are not sustainable, that are not neighborly, right? Because they pollute your neighbor's lungs. They imprison your neighbor's kids. They kill your neighbor's senior citizens. So we need to bring that Overton window back to what really is the middle, which is, wait a minute, the car is not in any way a reasonable solution for everybody. Now, obviously, people are going to say to you, well, I need my car. Now, there are some people who need their car. Maybe you're a plumber who has to bring that van around. Well, that plumber is better served by policies that make driving harder because for several reasons. One is it'd be less congestion. So that plumber would have more productivity and he would make more money. Same thing is true of the carpenter. Same thing is true of the senior citizen who, they always use this excuse, but I need to go drive and see my doctor. Great. If we make driving really hard, the few times you need to drive will be easier and won't be as frustrating. And we can, and, and, that, and that's only a result of reducing driving and improving transit. So that's where the, that's the happy middle, making everybody's, transportation universe happier it's not always going to be their driving universe sometimes it is you need to move a bookcase you're going to call your friend with the pickup truck he's going to come over he's going to be okay you're going to do that once a year that means you don't need a pickup truck the other 365 days of the year so don't have that truck because you're going to make extra trips you don't need to make so that's part of the discussion we have and, and at the community board level as you know it's always the status quo is seen as normal. And that's understandable. That's the way it is in America. But the status quo that we are living in right now is actually not normal. It is not normal 
to have so many people think they can get from point A to point B in a private vehicle that takes up more space than a, than a, than a bicycle, than a, than a bus, et cetera, it's not normal. So we need to actually shift the discussion to what is normal and what is sustainable. So All right. Uh, 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 Spencer, uh, Spencer. Wait, Blake, we're, 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 we're... Blake, wants to, Blake wants to jump down my throat, even though I supported him so many elections. Yes. No, I, I, do we have time for a fast question? Yes, of course. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, group. So, uh, okay. so you were talking about normal, right? So, so basically, in many small cities, you cannot park overnight. Many, any mm -hmm. town under fifty thousand people uh, all across the United States, there are signs that say after eleven o'clock or twelve o'clock, no parking on, on no public parking on the streets. And then you have the, um, and then we had the New York City rule up until nineteen fifty. There was no parking after midnight. So right. the normal was until so talk to the group a little bit about how the normal was pre nineteen fifty. There were no cars on the street, and that's why you see old photographs, even in the nineteen forties, and even even the, after the war, there are no cars on the streets. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I'm talking to you from Jackson Heights because I'm at my girlfriend's house, and she lives on Thirty Fourth Avenue, which was the gold standard open street, and there were a handful of car drivers who opposed this open street, saying. It's not, it's not normal. It's not the way, the, it doesn't look good. And then one of them ironically posted a picture of the neighborhood in the 1950s when there were no cars on the street at all. And it ostensibly looked the same as what the open street looked like. So they kind of undermined their message. The thing about the overnight parking, it's very simple. Um, you, there's, there's no way to put that genie back in the bottle right now because it's now 2023. And I'm not very good at math, but that's like three generations of New Yorkers have grown up with cars on every side, you know, cars on every curbside lane is being totally normal. I have friends of mine. I, I look at, the, I say, I, I say, look at this street. It is absolutely ridiculously ugly to have this beautiful tree lined street flanked by people's literally their private property thrown on the street, like garbage. I mean, we're talking about the cars. It's hunks of metal. It's ugly. And yet we've accepted this. Now, how do you put that genie back in the bottle? I have no idea. Because in Japan, for example, if you buy a car, you need to have an off-street parking space for it. And they've had this rule for generations. We don't have that rule. How are we going to put that, um, get that rule back in place? I, Blake, if you run on that, I will make sure you're elected. I'll <laughs> call in every favor I have. But I don't see you doing it. Yes. All right. And with, and with that. I mentioned that crickets from Blake. I love you, Blake. You and with that. that, now that Blake's been uh, properly uh talk to um gersh thank you so much for coming thank you for talking with us um as i said uh, pedestrian safety was one of the issues this group was founded upon and so we're all very happy to see read uh your work and the work of uh, others who write for streets blog um really appreciate it well stay um, in touch i put my i put my information in the chat yeah i was going to tell people uh gersh's information in the chat is so if you want to follow up with him uh he's his dms are open all right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, guys. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the polls, Blake. <laughs>